afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum and the Moving Beyond Earth exhibition. I'm Jennifer Lavasser, curator here at the Museum in Space History, and I want to welcome all of you to our Boeing-sponsored What's New in Aerospace series. Today, we're going to be talking about the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall, which you all entered as you came into the building today. Uh, this question, this uh, session is meant to be very informal, so we invite you to ask questions when we give you the opportunities throughout the program. We'll have some online questions as well from those watching at home. So to get us started, milestones of, the milestones of Flight Hall uh, recently transformed from what it was for many, many years into something new, fresh, and exciting for all of you to see as you came in the building. So what we're going to have here today are some staff from the museum giving you some insight into what their experiences were and putting that together for you, what it looks like now, where it's come from, uh, some of the things that we were faced with, some of the challenges, and of course, some of the things that we see happening down the road in the future for the museum itself and for Boeing, the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. So let's get started. I want to welcome to the stage two of my colleagues. Uh, on my right is Margaret Weidekamp, a curator here in our space history department, and Bob Vanderlinden, a curator in our aeronautics department. And Margaret and Bob were fundamentally uh, the sort of lead curators here in the museum on this project. And so I want to get some insight from them on their approach in particular to the milestones of Flight Hall. Well, Jennifer, when we started, really the first thing we started with was our visitors. Um, and we did what in the museum business we call formative evaluation, which meant we went out and asked visitors um, and watched visitors as they came through the Milestones Hall to get some sense of how they used that space. And what we found is what we kind of knew intuitively at the museum, that this is a really multifunctional space. So it's our, the introduction to the museum. It's the first place that any visitor is where they are actually in the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. So we want to give people some orientation, some idea about how to move into the rest of the space. Um, it's also the last thing. It's a lobby in an almost corporate sense, right? It's the place where you get a sense of who we are, what is, a, you know, what do we have to offer. It's the last impression that our visitors get. Um, but it also needs to be a thoroughfare. We know that we see seven million visits a year in this building alone, which means seven million through that space. Um, and it wasn't working well to get the people through well. Um, we know that it's also a space that uh, the museum uses for um, evening events, for award ceremonies or corporate events, things like that. So it needed to be able to be converted to a kind of event space. Very multi-purpose um, in that Very multi-purpose and it needed to really then, it's our central hall also. So for the historic content that we had, we needed to think about what we would be able to bring to visitors. And when it was built in the 1970s, there was an assumption that people knew what they were looking at when they came in. Um, because the Apollo program was only four years uh, past. The um, Spirit of St. Louis was only 50 years before. People would have been walking through the door who would have recognized that. And what we wanted to do then was really develop that. And when Bob and I were working on this, he then brought to the team this idea of these five major themes. So Bob, tell us a little bit about the themes that really shaped how the the exhibition, uh, the, the hall is shaped not only physically, but also in the sense of uh, it, uh, what we're trying to present with history. Well, thank you. Um, when this building opened in 1976, um, there, it was designed for 3 million people at most. and We ended up with 7 million. We've had 8, 9 million per year. The place has always been overwhelmed. The exhibitry has been overwhelmed. The labels have been overwhelmed. If you actually could find the labels, they're actually pretty decent. <laughs> But they're very hard, and we'll be discussing that later. But what we really wanted to put on the floor of the building is content, uh, some historical content and interpretation. So we have multiple themes we've come up with. There's how, how historians think uh, based on uh, certain uh, thematic principles from uh, progressive secondary education, where they teach themes rather than names and dates. Um, our overarching theme that Margaret came up with was that, and if you really think about it, is aviation and space flight has changed the world, and it truly has. And the secondary theme of that is how we, like, we want to ask our visitors, how do you think aviation and space flight has changed your world? And we ask you to take this, these ideas in your visit, not just in milestones, but throughout the building here, and also out to our Hazi Center at Dulles Airport. But guiding us in our five themes, um, more specifically, of course, uh, one is science and technology. We are a technology museum, first and foremost. But you can't have technology exist in a vacuum. 
Um, it's done, you know, it was created by people for a reason, so people are another theme. So we'll start saying biographical stories throughout, the human aspects of it. Um, these machines were built for a reason. Some were built for uh, political reasons, uh, you know, politics and power, that's another theme. Others were built, such as airliners, for uh, reasons of economics, business and economics, and that's the, another theme. But the last one is also culture. How has uh, aviation and space flight changed us, changed us as a society, changed us as a world? And we want people to see this, not in, just in this gallery, as I said, but throughout the building, throughout their experience here. And think of these five questions as you look at anything in the building. And you mentioned this sort of looking across the entire building. We should mention that this is one stage in a, in a many year process that the museum will be going through to transform itself from something people have been seeing for four decades basically into something that presents these five themes in a new way. And so people can expect to see this museum change considerably over the next decade, really following on to what milestones, the Milestones Project has really started. Um, is there, in the gallery itself, we can see some images up on the screen of different objects that are in the gallery. Is there a particular uh, example of an object, you think, in, in all of the moves and changes that happened in this space, is there a particular object may have benefited in a significant way from being moved from where it was as the part of this thoroughfare, really, into a new space? Well, it really is a hall that has these kind of signature objects that uh, introduce people to the collections here at the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, one that benefited in particular is Friendship 7, which is a Mercury spacecraft. It's only six feet in diameter. Uh, John Glenn's spacecraft from his first American orbits of the Earth in 1962. That had always been kind of out in the middle of the floor, and depending on what path you took through the hall, you might miss it entirely. Um, and being able to put it, first of all, for the object itself, it's in uh, much better conditions right now. So it had been in a kind of plex case. Um, this now we've built basically a case that really is a room for it um, that protects it much better, um, that puts it on display. And then one of the things that we wanted to do in terms of, you know, thinking about the stories that this tells, we wanted to bring that to our visitors. So in 1976, his flight had only been 14 years before in 1962. Um, now we really wanted to tell people, um, in some ways, the story the way that John Glenn, Senator Glenn tells it. When, when he talks about his flight, he starts immediately with, you have to understand it was the Cold War, um, and puts it in that broader um, political context and then we also wanted just to highlight the person of John Glenn, a United States, long serving United States Senator uh, who flew to space both on uh, the Mercury spacecraft Friendship 7, but also on uh, the Space Shuttle Discovery, which the museum also has at the Udvar-Hasse Center. Uh, so being able to tell that personal story of who was this marine aviator who became an astronaut, who became a senator, who has really become this national hero, and how is it that we have this spacecraft from that context? And you're mentioning the, the, time, the difference in time, really, between the events that these uh, artifacts were used in, the use of them, and today, and how that has changed dramatically. Um, how have we approached connecting people in new ways? across that time span where you've got entire new generations of people coming in with new technologies and new ideas and maybe some no conception of where these things have been come, have come from and been used how are we looking at maybe shaping new connections with our visitors well, one of the things that we did was, um, and this was a new challenge for Bob and for I, is to really think about this exhibit, not only in the physical exhibit, but in terms of digital. Uh, we know that most of our visitors come through the, um, the doors now carrying their own smartphone, carrying their own connection to the internet. Um, and that's a wonderful asset. And also, it's a part of the visitor experience. One of the first things you do is you used to pull out a camera, now you pull out your phone, take a picture, um, remember that you were here, and so create those memories. And we wanted to bring all of those things into a digital experience as well as the physical experience of the hall. And we did it at the same time. Normally, when the, in the exhibit process, you write the script, you start, and one of the last things you do is the digital, which drives our digital people crazy. <laughs> um, and, but we didn't have the time. We did this gallery in less than three years. It was a remarkably short period of time and be able to present the digital aspect and more conventional ones, you have to do this all at once. And that was a huge challenge. 
And it's a juggling project for the curators then to think about, you know, what stories are best told using video or online or on an app, what stories are best uh, put in front of people in a print form so that they're on the label for everyone to see, what are good ones that people are going to want to go home and experience things outside these walls. We found that actually, we hope it, we, it's quite successful. You can only put so many things, about five labels on one of the exhibit panels there. But through the web and other aspects, you can get deeper in it, even on your, on your cell phone. If you really want to dig deep, we have the information there for you. Great. Well, that gives, uh, I think, our visitors here a little bit of sense of where things started. Um, if anybody has questions, please feel free to step up to the microphone. We can take them here. Uh, we're going to start out with an online question first. Will any of the exhibits change in milestones as time goes by? So are there any particular, obviously we've got large artifacts in there, are there smaller artifacts in the exhibition that will uh, shift and change and maybe present new themes? Well, no exhibit is you know, etched in stone. It will evolve over time. We have deliberately incorporated a, um, a not, we don't call it a temporary space, do we? But a we have rotating one that will evolve, case. A rotating the case does case. not spin. You know, the no, the materials does, change. Oh, that would be nice. Um, <laughs> but that way we can introduce new material every six months, every year or so, just to keep it fresh. But, you know, um, the milestones are, you know, pretty much standard. But um, this will give us an opportunity to move new stuff in and out. So there, no gallery ever stays put. For the inaugural exhibit, we have a collection of Sally Ride's artifacts that are um, part of a collection of both uh, Dr. Ride's papers as well as physical artifacts that came in after her death in 2012 and so we were able to put those on exhibit. Uh, we've talked about um, possibly some ballooning artifacts um, going back to as far as the 1780s that wow. may come into that collection in the future. Uh, the museum has acquired um, papers and materials from Arthur C. Clarke. That's the kind of thing that could go on in the future and it's a nice way for us to be able to have a space where we can feature a new collection. So we've, uh, and I'll ask a question <clears throat> since we don't have anyone at the microphone, but a uh, question for you, Margaret, uh, just to tell our visitors a little bit about your personal experience with this. Um, what's been one of the most, um, let's say, media intense experiences for you? Um, Margaret is our, <clears throat> excuse me, is our curator of the Starship Enterprise. So tell us a little bit about sort of the um, process going into putting that back on display. Because it may not seem to many people like that is a milestone of flight. That is one of the questions that we get. Um, one of the pieces that we added to the Milestones of Flight Hall, in addition to two prototype uh, jet engines, uh, was also the 11-foot studio model of the Star Trek Starship Enterprise. Um, and the argument for putting that in the south lobby of the Milestones of Flight Hall was really that imagination and inspiration have been really important themes for this museum since the 1970s. They've been a part of the collection here at the National Air and Space Museum for decades. And if we were going to come up with one object that really was a signature piece for imagination and inspiration, I couldn't think of a better one than the Star Trek Enterprise. I think many of us would agree with you. We're going to go to an audience question next. How many people did it take to build the new Milestones Gallery? Uh, how many people are in the museum? <laughs> it's a tremendous team effort. There were four different curators, uh, Alex Spencer and Paul Ceruzzi, as well as Bob and myself. Uh, we were working with uh, exhibit designers, a uh, whole conservation team that was working on um, putting all of these objects together. We have a really crack collections. Uh, staff who were working on the actual hanging and moving of all of these objects, keeping track of all of the move, literally moving pieces of this, um, and then working with architects and case designers. Um, our exhibits technology staff did the lighting and uh, the electronics for this. We were working with digital and new media about thinking about uh, the development of the wall, as well as the app, as well as the website and interactives. So um, I'm going to leave people off, but well, that was hundreds, hundreds of, of that, yeah, presumably. Uh, development, well, excuse me, advancement this way. <laughs> One thing you learn when you do an exhibit is that it starts off with a very small core, and three years ago it was basically Margaret and myself, and by the time you get done with it, just about everybody in the building has, has touched it in some way. 
Um, even if, it's, if someone may be extremely obscure, but maybe you went to that person, asked them a question to get an answer. But some, just about everybody had something to do with it. The Center for Earth and Planetary Studies contributed a lot when we were looking at images of Moon or Mars or things like that, um, being able to have the right pictures for us and tell us what we were looking at. Um, so well, it's a tremendous the, team. We'll see it in a few minutes, but the uh, Apollo 17 photograph of the rock, they, they reminded us that they had that, and we didn't know that. So. Yeah. We'll go with one more audience question, but thank you for that. Hi there. Hello. Oh. Um, is as spaceflight becomes increasingly privatized and there's more and more people getting involved in that, does that pose any sort of challenge for getting artifacts for, like you've got Spaceship One hanging in the entry hall there, does that pose any more challenges compared to uh, government agencies, previous monopoly on space flight? And slight follow-up, has anyone asked Elon Musk for anything yet? <laughs> <laughs> Taking the second part first, I believe yes, and I think we're working on it. Yes, um, that is true. And then, um, in some ways, we're following the lead from aeronautics, right? The, which um, is uh, aviation moved from mostly government-sponsored to um, being mostly private um, in terms of commercial aviation some decades ago. Um, we're looking at the attempts in the spaceflight arena for that same transition to happen, to privatize. Um, behind you, there's a model of uh, Spaceship Two uh, that came to us from Virgin Galactic. Above that is a model of the uh, Bigelow modules, that um, one of which is now at the International Space Station. So uh, we have active relationships um, between the museum and some of these private companies, and as with all of our subjects, as aviation and spaceflight continue to develop, we are thinking about what artifacts do we bring in to really preserve that history. Well, thank you for that. We're going to move thank on you. with a short little introduction, uh, kind of give you a preview of how this all came about. Since 1976, the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum has displayed the most renowned collection of historic air and spacecraft in the world. More than 60,000 artifacts that bring the rich history of flight to life. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Now, thanks to a $30 million donation from Boeing, the museum's main attraction, Milestones of Flight Hall, will undergo a 21st century transformation. Iconic symbols of amazing discoveries that span the aerial age to the space age and beyond will show how these events connect to one another and reveal untold stories of the people who helped make history. John Glenn's Friendship 7 spacecraft, Charles Lindbergh's Spirit of St. Louis, revolutionary turbojet engines, and Telstar, the first communication satellite in space. Completed in time for the museum's 40th anniversary in 2016, visitors will experience a dynamic interactive display, melded with an integrated mobile experience. More than seven million people visit the Air and Space Museum every year. Soon, they'll be marveling at an exhibit like no other. This is where history is preserved, for the pioneers of the past who advanced our world, and the explorers of the future who will transform it for generations to come. Well, I think you can see from that little video, things have really dramatically changed. That video was produced two years ago, and so um, the space looks, looks significantly different. And uh, now we can welcome on stage Ashley Hornish, who is our exhibit designer for the project. And we'll talk a little bit about sort of where you fit into this picture as far as uh, moving things around and, and redesigning this space to really be modern and new and fresh and really take us down the road um, for decades to come, presumably. Um, what were some of the overall challenges? Tell us a little bit about some of the overall challenges that you, you faced in dealing with this project. Well, if you can imagine the original milestones of Flight Hall before the renovation, um, you, know, you come through security, you pick up all your bags, you have your kids, and by the time you kind of think about it, you're in the middle of milestones and you've already passed the moon rock, you've passed the Gemini Mercury spacecraft, some of the most important things in the space, and you can't figure out where to get a map because you can't see the welcome desk because the Apollo Command module's in your way. 
you can't find any of the labels, um, and you're kind of flying around the space like a pinball. So um, we thought a lot about the problems with the original space and how we could improve them. I think everyone in our design department over the past decade had thought you know, of ways that we could improve milestones, but we never had the money to do it. Um, everything was kind of piecemeal over, uh, you know, over the course of the 40 years that it's been open. And so luckily with Boeing, we had the opportunity to really think about the best way to do milestones. And so the new space um, that we designed put everything along the sides of the gallery. And that did several things for us. It allowed um, better sight lines, which now you can see this beautiful welcome center desk that we have. Um, we can see the new interactive wall. Um, we can find, uh, the visitors can find labels more easily. They're right next to the objects. And it just had more clean look to it. And um, I, it just really opens up the space for special events, as we mentioned before, and just help the visitor move through the space. So Margaret, as a curator and thinking about what kinds of objects you want in a space like this, um, how flexible were, was it uh, for you to be able to sort of, uh, you know, insert new ideas, um, you know, suggest new objects, um, and work with Ashley on really coming up with a plan on how to organize things? Some of the pieces that were already in the Boeing Milestones of Hall, Flight Hall were the ones that we would want to have anyway. The Friendship 7, Gemini 4, um, Spirit of St. Louis, obviously. Uh, the Columbia, the Apollo 11 command module, had really been a centerpiece for that gallery. Um, and the museum had broader plans for that. that the, uh, we would love to put that into a new dedicated gallery that really explains uh, the Apollo program in some ways modeled on the tremendous success of the Wright Brothers exhibition um, for in 2003 for the 100th anniversary of the first powered flight the Wright Brothers original Wright Flyer which had always hung right in the middle of that gallery was moved upstairs to its own dedicated space and that has been such a tremendous success over the last 10-15 uh, years that there are plans to do something similar with Apollo 11 which then got us to thinking about possibly moving uh, the lunar module into this space. So uh, there were some limits on what we could do. Um, there was a moment when we thought we might move the X-15, the very, very large uh, black aircraft that uh, could fly up to uh, Mach 6, and then Bob pointed out that that was one of the heaviest things hanging in the museum, <laughs> and that was not going to move. Um, so we do have limitations on ceiling <laughs> So we weight. did we have, have some, everything we want. some and, and on how much we can ask, any, um, uh, to be honest, it becomes a budget question. If you're going to move a very, very heavy thing, then you get, there are limits on what other things you can do, and we decided right. it was in a good spot. So Ashley, tell us about some of the other limitations that you faced in redesigning the space. Well, I think that the challenge, the biggest challenge that we had was, you know, how do we uh, build this exhibit when we can't close the space, right? So um, it took a ton of planning, <laughs> lots of early hours, lots of late hours, and um, it was just a real challenge. And usually we can just say, well, just close off the gallery, um, just close the door, no one goes in, no, no one from the public, but we didn't have that option here. We had to keep the space open, as Margaret mentioned, and Bob, that this is the main entrance and exit to the building, and it needed to stay that way. So uh, we were just very creative about it, and I think what was really great is we had the opportunity to show the public what we do when we build an exhibition, and it just happened that these objects were so amazing that we um, got to see conservation, working on um, preserving these artifacts and really bringing them up to this amazing level. And so um, just having them all on the floor, having to bring down the spirit of St. Louis, um, Bell X-1, and seeing the work being done was really interesting. And then also the work on the lunar module, um, making it appear more like the Apollo 11 mission, um, was just a really great uh, experience, I think, for our visitors. But I will point out that usually the designer only has to think about what is the final design. Right. What am I starting with and what am I ending with? And for Ashley, then she was having to redesign this gallery week by week by week of how are we going to move these uh, barriers around so that we can create enough space for the work to be done and yet let the visitor come all the way through. Um, so she had dozens of plans of what this was all going to look like and how she was going to be able to move these barriers around so that we could do all of the work and then get uh, to the end state. 
And these are some really large artifacts, so it's not like we just pick them up and move them, you know, by hand. It takes a lot of effort. Right, and as I said, tons of planning and collections was great, as is conservation, everyone else involved of just trying to figure out. It was a puzzle. Luckily, I love puzzles, but um, <laughs> just trying to figure out how all of these things are going to fit on the floor. How can we move them around when we need to? And luckily, we had movable barriers. We just planned ahead to try to make sure that would work. So tell us a little bit about how you approach putting artifacts out on the floor that might be a little bit different than what people saw before. Right, so um, one challenge that we had was how do we get these major artifacts um, into their big cases? And as Margaret said, this is kind of a, a giant room that's housing the Gemini and Mercury spacecraft. And so what I think people don't realize is that a lot of these large artifacts are on wheels. And that's how we um, move them into the space. So what you can see is um, the Mercury spacecraft being wheeled into its giant case. And then the kind of beauty of the design is that then it all gets covered, all of this giant um, metal stands, which I think everyone was really nervous about until they saw the final product of like, oh, these aren't the most beautiful stands, but the whole base of it where all the giant casters wheels were um, ended up hidden. So um, under a real puzzle, again, yes. of um, right. different interlocking pieces that then create what looks like a seamless floor. Right, and even the, even the lunar module is on wheels. And so it just doesn't look like that at all, but that's how we were able to move it around the gallery, get it into its final location as, as easily as possible. So you mentioned, Ashley, at the beginning that um, one of the things that was lost when people would enter is the moon rock. Tell us a little bit about how you thought about putting that in a new position and really giving people a sense of what that is that they're seeing. Right. So the moon rock um, kiosk that we had it in before was just very generic. I mean, there was nothing about the moon rock. It wasn't, I mean, the moon rock was very cool, but there was nothing to give any extra information about why it was so important, why it was such a neat thing for you to experience. And so when we were thinking about it as a team, you know, how can we make this a more engaging experience uh, for our audience? And we found this image that we mentioned before. Um, and this is my favorite image in the entire uh, gallery, <laughs> in the entire redo. And so you can see where the arrow is pointing to that rock. That is our rock. That is what you touch when you are in Milestones. <laughs> it is the most amazing thing ever. And how we didn't do this before, I don't know. But this is from the Apollo 17 mission. And so we point that out to our visitors. So if you haven't seen the new display yet, please go check it out. And we've also included a whole graphic panel about um, you know, lunar exploration and the moon rock and what it is and why it's important. So definitely check that out as well. And before we move on to questions, I just want to briefly have you mention some of the issues of sound that we deal with in the gallery. It's, it's, it's a really large box, basically, with glass ceilings and walls. And so how did you deal with trying to make the sound a little bit less uh, dispersed, I guess you would say? Right, so the big murals that you see in Milestones are actually acoustic walls. So they're kind of a sound absorbent. And um, MFM, our designers, had a, a great idea about this. And what you see here are, um, uh, on, the, on the left side is uh, an image of Mars, uh, which is behind the Viking lander. And that was created from Viking orbiter data by Andy Johnston, who was one of our former geographers in the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies. He's now vice president at the Adler Planetarium. And it just has an amazing amount of detail if you get close up to it. It's, it's really great. And then the center image is the moon. But it looks a little bit different than the images of the moon you might be used to. And that's because it's made of radar data from radio telescopes in Puerto Rico and West Virginia. And Bruce Campbell, who's the uh, chair for the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies here, created this just for us from his research that he's doing right now. And what's also interesting about it is the North Pole is actually kind of at the bottom middle of the image, not at the top. And then those two are new, brand new. And then the, the image on the right, of course, is Earth. And that's the famous blue marble photograph, the first kind of full view of Earth from space. And I guess I didn't realize before I worked on this project how important that, that image was culturally and how it changed kind of the way humankind viewed our place in the universe. And so that was really neat yeah. for me. Well, and I'll point out that Dr. Lavasser has written a wonderful <laughs> dissertation about that, and we were really pleased NASA went back to the film and redigitized it at a very, very high resolution for us, and that's what allows us to put that beautiful image up in the gallery. Yeah. Well, we're going to have one online question here before we get moving on. Were there artifacts that couldn't be moved when redesigning the milestones of Flight Hall? Yes, Margaret. Yes, um, the two missiles that are on the side of the gallery, um, the uh, 
Soviet SS-20 and an American Pershing II represent uh, two artifacts that are there per terms of a treaty from 1987, uh, the INF, the Intermediate uh, Nuclear Forces Treaty, and we, basically the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the 1980s decided to eliminate an entire class of nuclear weapons. So these are intermediate range, not the big intercontinental ballistic missiles, but intermediate range, and as a part of the treaty, each country kept 13 examples of those to put on public display in a museum. We are one of those museums. And so um, the exact location of those in latitude and longitude down to the second, which means to the um, 100 feet north or south or 80 feet east and west, um, is registered with the Pentagon, the State Department, and the, uh, and the Russian <laughs> government. And so that was something that just the team decided, we're not going anywhere near that. that yeah, we're gonna, probably um, better to move on from that. <laughs> they stay exactly where they are. I think to the point where we literally put flooring up around those rather than picking them up, moving them, and redoing the flooring under them. Wow. Well, some, yeah, some serious things to concern, uh, consider when moving uh, artifacts, obviously. We'll thank both of you, uh, and we're going to move on to another segment, but here's a short video introduction of what we'll talk about next. Here at the National Air and Space Museum tonight, we are lowering the Spirit of St. Louis to the floor of the Boeing Milestones of Flight Gallery and we will give our visitors a wonderful opportunity to see this remarkable aircraft up close in a way that normally they will not have a chance to. So it's a very rare opportunity. The Spirit of St. Louis is one of our most significant artifacts. It is the aircraft in which Charles Lindbergh became the first person to fly nonstop solo across the Atlantic Ocean in 1927. And that flight uh, really set the world on fire. Lindbergh flew his Spirit of St. Louis from New York to Paris a distance of 3,610 miles in 33 and a half hours. It was very, very hazardous because he did it by himself. There was no communications of that time to speak of. And um, if he ever went down, he would have gone down in the middle of the, the North Atlantic. The fact that one man did it by himself, nonstop, really struck a chord with the nation and frankly, with the world. We got the plane in 1928, and since then, it's been suspended in either the Arts and Industries building or here in our National Air and Space Museum. The work on the aircraft is part of the refurbishment of our Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall, which is due to be completed in 2016. While the aircraft will be on the floor, it will be looked at by our conservators and restoration technicians just to make sure the airplane is fine. Well, this really is a rare opportunity to get a close-up look at the Spirit of St. Louis. Uh, it hasn't been down to the floor for about 22 years. My primary concerns are the, are the condition of the fabric. Uh, we're noticing uh, tears in the fabric. Another one of our primary concerns is about the state of uh, preservation on the engine. This is our rare opportunity to really be able to deal with any kind of corrosion issues that may have developed over the years and basically give it a good preservation treatment that'll last for another couple decades into the future. I hope our visitors uh, will be able to see the aircraft in a new light with our new exhibitry and get up a lot closer to it than before, see it from different angles. It makes it more personal and perhaps even a more memorable experience. Well, the Spirit of St. Louis is a national icon. I mean, it's, it's one of the most widely recognized aircraft in the entire world. And it's important that we preserve it for future generations to really carry on that amazing story. This is what makes it fun. You can just see all the little, little details about it. <laughs> it's great. Well, I want to welcome Bob back to the stage and also welcome Malcolm Collum, our chief conservator, who you saw in the video here. And I think you can see their passion for this project through that video, um, which is really kind of a, a fun thing to show all of you, is just how much we all really do care about what we do here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Spirit of St. Louis as a case study in this, uh, in this, uh, this space that people have been traveling through today. Um, Bob, talk a little bit about not only the history of the aircraft itself, but about sort of your philosophy and, and what you were thinking about in looking at the aircraft anew on the floor and putting it into this, uh, back into this gallery, this, well, this exhibition space. Thank you. First off, you can tell we have the best job in the world, period. <laughs> and certainly have a lot of fun when, we, when we're doing it. Um, the Spirit, obviously, is one of our um, most 
important, iconic artifacts, and we want to do our best to take the absolute best care possible, keep it around in as an original form as, as long as possible. We got it originally uh, in 1928, and it's basically been untouched. We brought it down in 1992 because we were kind of concerned that there may be some corrosion issues, particularly with the engine mounts, and particularly with the fuselage. It's a metal, it's a steel tube fuselage. Um, <clears throat> when we had it down there, um, we x-rayed it and found out it was in remarkably good shape. Um, but I've been here a long time, and when Malcolm mentioned it was been 22 years, I've, to me it was like yesterday. <laughs> and so in 22 years, Lord knows what may have happened to it. Um, it's been in the same place, but it's been in the sunlight. I hate to say it, it's been, you know, some water has dripped on it from time to time. And the fact is it was built in 1927 and built in only two months. Um, we really don't know the condition of the aircraft until you really take it down and take a look at it. And this is one airplane we have to get right, and we want to keep it as close to perfect as humanly possible. So Malcolm, uh, some of the terms that we hear talked about in terms of working on these, ar uh, these artifacts are preservation, restoration, conservation. Tell us a little bit about the philosophy going forward on a, in a milestone object like the Spirit of St. Louis, what approach you were taking. Well, I mean, from a conservator's standpoint, it doesn't get any better than this. I mean, it's, it's, it embodies the sort of the perfect artifact. It has this incredible history, but yet it's really untouched. I mean, it's been hanging from the ceiling for ever since we had it brought into the museum in 1928. So it, uh, the fact that it has its original fabric on it from that time period, I mean, f for most flying aircraft that have dope and fabric coverings, as a rule of thumb, you change that material out every 10 or 15 years. So to have this fabric still intact is just, it's nothing short of a miracle. So the big challenge from my perspective is to carry on that legacy of perfect preservation. Um, and so we, we brought in techniques that are used by paintings conservators to repair the fabric and we, we treat it just like a painted canvas. Interesting. Um, so it does look very fragile. I mean, from the outside, it doesn't look like, uh, say, the X-15, for example, which is obviously very heavy, bulky, looks indestructible in some ways. So when we got the aircraft originally, were there already issues that could potentially cause problems down the road that you then were looking at anew uh, during this project? Well, I mean, when, they, uh, when, when Lindbergh landed in Paris, of course, he was stormed by, what, 150,000 150, enthusiastic people, Parisians? All wanting a souvenir. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, most it, of them got one. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was immediately recognized that this was a, a, a serious moment in history. Um, and of course, people wanted to capture a little bit of souvenir from the airplane. And you can see in these images where people had literally carved out sections of the fuselage fabric. Um, and uh, the, the Ryan emblem on the rudder on, on the right-hand side is, is still missing today. Um, and so at, at, at one point, they'd, they initially thought that they could patch the fuselage and get away with that. Um, and then later on, decided to just completely recover everything from basically the cockpit back to the tail. So that's all French linen. Uh, whereas the rest of their craft is the original cotton fabric from the Rhine factory. Um, so uh, in addition to the, the damage that sustained at, uh, at the airport in Paris, he then flew on to Brussels and then landed in uh, an airport just outside of London at an uh, airport called Croydon. Um, and there he had the same situation where thousands of enthusiastic visitors rushed the airplane and uh, one of the visitors uh, damaged the horizontal stabilizers, and that's the damage that you see right there. You see this distinct difference in the type of uh, tapes across the leading edge. You can see some stitching there, and then uh, the tapes across that ridge there. Those are all repairs that were made while it was in London. So one of the most distinctive features I think everybody recognizes on the Spirit of St. Louis are the uh, engine cowling panels that have all these great flags and things on it. And here's a shot you could talk about a little bit. Um, when you brought the aircraft down, you removed the panels. Tell us what you learned about them, their appearance then and their appearance now. Well, uh, the, there were a number of things that were concerning us from, uh, from the previous observations before we actually got it to the ground. One was um, the fact that some of the paint was flaking on, on some of these emblems. So e each of these emblems represent different stops on his goodwill tour through, down through Central and uh, South America into the Caribbean. Um, and so it was very important to try to keep those things, but we knew that you know, different, at different venues, a different artist was brought in to paint their national flag and write something on there. So they use different types of paints. And of course, paint on, on bare aluminum is not a good surface that has good adhesion qualities over time. So that was one of our primary objectives, to try to save these original flags. We also have this issue with this yellowing on the, on the cowling panels. So that, that decorative feature that you see on all the panels, that's called engine turning, the sort of a popular decorative feature that you saw in a lot of things at that time period. 
Um, it was a way of hiding the, uh, the machining marks and hammer marks from forming the panels. Um, and so for the longest time, the museum thought that, well, that must be a coating, maybe a, a linseed oil that was put on during a previous uh, repair attempt. Um, but then we realized after analysis that uh, that's an original coating. And when you look at the, uh, the evolution of, the, of aluminum as an alloy in, in the aircraft industry, uh, there's a, an alloy called duraluminum, which is basically um, a 2000 series aluminum with a cladding of pure aluminum, makes it very corrosion resistant. And that came out, that invention came out in 1927, the year that he made this flight. <laughs> So chances are he did not have this alloy on these cowling panels. So it was just sort of a rule of thumb that any, any bare aluminum on any sort of manufactured item would have a clear protective coating on it to prevent corrosion. So how did they get the yellow to go away? Well, how did you clean it? Well, the, the, and that was the biggest fear too. So if you look at the upper image here, you can see how the panel looks in, in just normal uh, daylight. <clears throat> and then when you look at it under ultraviolet light, uh, organic coatings will fluoresce. They'll put out, they'll transmit a, another light wave um, after they've been exposed to, uh, to fluorescent light. And metals do not fluoresce. So what you're seeing all the purple there is basically bare metal that is reflecting back the, uh, the UV lamp. Um, so it, it really illustrated there were a number of layers on there. There was a base coating of lacquer put on there, and then some of the flags were given a protective coating after they had been painted. And you cleaned it with what material? Because I think everybody wants, how do we clean things? Because yeah. people walk around their house dusting with Windex, uh, you know, all kinds of end dust, whatever it is. We don't use those kind of products. Very what scientific. do we use to clean yes. things? Yes, yeah. well, I mean, in, in, in the conservation world, we call it mild enzymatic solution. And um, what it really is is, is spit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because it is a mild enzy enzymatic solution. It's a, it's a great way to remove just basic grime off of surfaces. And it's been a long-standing technique used by paintings conservators. Um, but uh, you know, we did use some mild detergents here and there, but basically most of the, most of the dis discoloration that you saw on the panels was just from atmospheric accumulations from the seven million visitors that, that we get every year. So uh, when you had the aircraft down, were there any particularly interesting or new discoveries you made while it was uh, available for you and, and probably won't be available for a while to come? Well, I, I, as with any sort of artifact that we bring into the lab or work on down, downtown, we. Before we lay hands on something, we do in-depth analysis. We, we try to study what we have here. We do the historical analysis. We communicate with the curators that know the specific history of that artifact. It's, I mean, it's, it's really the best part of my job is that every project is a completely new thing to learn about. Um, and I came across a reference where, um, I guess, the, the manager of the airport in Paris had made a reference that the oil tank had a 20 millimeter split in it. And he was very really? startled by that. <clears throat> and so I thought, well, that's strange, uh, I've got to go check out the oil tank. And sure enough, you look at it, and it's right there in plain view once you get the cowling panels off. And sure enough, when you look at the historic photographs from the Mobile Oil Company, they're the ones that sponsored the, uh, part of, partly sponsored the flight, they show the first oil change where they're draining the oil out of this tank. And you can see this wash of black oil staining oh. coming down the side of the tank. <clears throat> and then the next shot shows them filling up the tank with br fresh oil, and by then, they've gone in and, and repaired that split. And so you see it in these grainy black and white photographs from 1927, and you go to look at the airplane, and there it is. There's this big split that, uh, that happened in his oil tank. And, I mean, it, it's sort of a, a brush with catastrophe. Thankfully, he did land with enough reserve oil in his engine, so it really wasn't an issue, but it still is a, a pretty close call. And you had one found object as well, something that you didn't expect. Yes, and that's another great aspect of my job is that you know, whenever you look at something that hasn't been observed for decades, sometimes even centuries, depending on what the object is, inevitably you're gonna find something that hasn't been brought to light before. And so for the Spirit of St. Louis, this rare opportunity to have this object on the ground for close examination, uh, there's some folks out west that are building a replica of the Spirit of St. Louis, and they came out and they wanted to get accurate dimensions and good photography. They brought a boroscope camera, and were looking down in, in areas that uh, normally you can't see, and they spotted a pair of pliers directly below the main fuel tank and behind the instrument panel. So an area that's completely inaccessible, just about completely inaccessible. Because a few weeks later, so, so, so in the boroscope, they, they saw in this sort of fog of dust accumulations, a pair of pliers laying down there on the wow. belly fabric of the fuselage. So a few weeks later, I was able to contort my arm in there, <laughs> get these things out of there safely. And once I, I dusted them off, I, I remember running up to Bob's office and... <laughs> yeah. Look what I found. 
found. And showing <laughs> that, you know, hey, the, the, just look right. at when. Where are they from? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was clearly evident that these were old pliers. And the fact that they had this grayish green paint applied to the handles, which matched the paint that's on the oil tanks, the fuel tanks, oh. the airframe, those are original Ryan factory pliers that were meant to go with that airplane. Cool. Very cool. Well, what a, uh, an interesting thing to find out. Um, we're going to transition here to a little introduction to our next segment, but thank you to Bob Malkin for talking to the about the spirit of St. Louis. Um, and uh, let's move on to the video. Right there you can see one of our newest projects as part of the Milestones of Flight Hall project, something we call the Interactive Wall. And I want to welcome to the stage Vicki Portway, head of our digital experience. And of course, welcome back to Margaret. Margaret, you were one of the stars of the video, so you have, um, you've gotten yourself very involved in this project. Um, but talk a little bit about what it meant to, and you mentioned it a little bit earlier, what it meant to sort of bring the digital into your thinking about how it is we present history here. Well, we were really excited about the potential that we get with, uh, with this interactive wall, with the app, with being able to create uh, some special videos that explain some of our content um, and being able to bring this real story-based approach to our website. Um, and Vicki really was the brains behind thinking through what that strategy would be, not only for the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall, but then moving us out into the rest of the museum experience in the building and with outside. So Vicki, tell us a little bit about where this uh, app and interactive wall project originated. Well, it was really an opportunity along with the exhibition project to rethink the way that we're doing interactive technologies in the exhibition space as well as how do we transition that to online and engaging people wherever they are, whether they want to come through the website or use mobile devices when they're here or offsite. You know, thinking about the devices that we use every single day and how we communicate with our families and friends and then sharing our compelling stories in a way that really gets people excited and wants them to stay connected with us. So the physical wall is actually just the physical piece of that broader in interactive experience across all of our digital platforms. And it really was about rethinking how we tell these stories to make them as stories, right? If you got stuck in the gallery with Bob or me, we would talk your ear off with stories. <laughs> um, and we can create a little bit of that in a more manageable sense uh, through some of these digital technologies. So what was one of the approaches you took to telling these stories? I think one of the things that we talked about over the course of certainly my experience here at the museum is, is bringing those stories in a more visual way to people. Obviously, this is a very visual experience, but how many, tell people how many videos were made just for this project? <laughs> well, we made 75 videos to start. You know, it's, <laughs> it's groundwork for making more stories. Um, but we want to, you know, iterate that and figure out what are the stories that really engage people and get them interested and what are the stories that people want to hear and what is the way that they want to hear them. And, and so we've, we've made these stories, we've talked about ways of making content that's more uh, manageable and even tweetable in some cases. Uh, so we want to present these in a way that are really engaging for people and, and correspond to their own interests because we want to make it a much more personalized experience and give people control over what kinds of content they want and when they want it, um, make it more relevant to their experience in their lives today 
uh, we're able to change the content very frequently. So if something new happens, like last week we had the Apollo anniversary and we were able to put things up on the wall and online introduce new stories that related to that anniversary and that mission. Um, when Juno made it to Jupiter that same day, we were able to put something up on the wall and get people thinking about what does that mean? How does that change my world? Along with the major theme of the gallery. So, and it really oh. became a tremendous asset for the curatorial staff because as we want to tell the stories of people or politics and power, things like that, we can create those as stories that will go on the website, that will go on the app or as videos. So if people are here in the, in the museum itself, they can obviously interact with this wall, but is there some part of this that makes it possible to kind of carry that experience on? Or how, does the, how do these things sort of interrelate to what we're trying to develop with our visitors overall? Yeah, well, as, as Margaret mentioned, the whole uh, you know, core of this experience is stories. And stories, luckily, can be experienced anywhere. So if you're on the website, you can see the same stories that you can see on the app if you're walking through the museum, or that you connect to through the wall. Like I said, that's the physical element. But really, if you're interacting with the wall, that will lead you, hopefully, to get on the app where you can really dive deep into the content, into commentary from our experts, see things actually in flight in these historic videos. Um, so it, it, it's really leading everyone to these stories and then giving them those stories wherever they want it. Um, so we have a video, <laughs> we just showed a little bit of how the wall operates. Um, but as you explore things on the wall, it not only tells you where you can find things in the museum, uh, but it also shows you connections between objects, which is something we iterate on the uh, app as well as the website. For instance, a lot of people come to see the Wright Flyer or the Apollo 11 command module, um, but they may not realize that fabric from the 1903 Wright Flyer flew on the Apollo 11 mission. And we have that piece of fabric in the Wright Brothers Gallery up on the wall on a plaque, and you might miss that otherwise if it hadn't been brought out in these connections that we're trying to reveal to people. The digital pieces are also very connected to, and we started talking a lot about an experience loop, really, that if you are in the gallery and you go up to to the interactive wall and you favorite things and you find things that you like, you can then download that directly into the app. Uh, you will be able to find those things when you go out onto the website and it really um, creates uh, an experience that is very uh, powerful and seamless, I think, in the way that people, especially uh, young people, are very used to using their devices and carrying things from one format to another. Um, it's something that we wanted to do with our content as well. Vicki, you mentioned this, was an, this is going to be an iterative process. This is something that will continue to change and grow and be shaped over time, especially based on the input of our uh, visitors. How much has the project changed from the very beginning, though? A lot. I mean, it, we had a very clear vision of what we wanted to do with the app. Um, I think uh, the website kind of evolved based on other projects that were happening in parallel, but the wall really changed and morphed over the period of this project, um, and everything converged very nicely. And it's really set this foundation for all the transformation that's ahead for the museum. We're going to be doing all the galleries in the, in the museum, and this story strategy will sustain through that. So we're really excited to see it grow and expand. Um, and continually add content and then share that content with people who want to remain engaged with us through the app. You can get little notifications anytime a new story comes up. So um, we want to remain you know, constantly talking to visitors and hearing what they want and really responding to that. Well, and that broader argument that we're making in the Central Hall that aviation and spaceflight have transformed the world, that it touches your lives in all kinds of ways that you don't think of as aviation or space flight stories, whether it's uh, fresh fruit in the middle of the winter or f uh, seafood away from a coast or just the idea that you're going to navigate your car using a constellation of satellites while you're also getting satellite weather on your phone. Mm -hmm. um, all of those things are really aviation and space flight stories and the transformation of the museum as a whole is going to allow us to develop from this very introductory argument that we could do in milestones into 20 more galleries where we can think about globalization or we can think about space race or we can look at aviation and warfare um, and really think about all of the different ways that aviation and space flight for good or for ill have really True. changed how we live um, and touch many parts of our lives on a day-to-day -day basis so how do people get the app Vicki? So you can go to the iTunes store and download the app for iPhone. We'll have an Android version coming soon. And um, obviously, you can go to the website and enjoy the stories there. 
um, and interact with the wall if you haven't already. How many didn't see the wall when they walked in? You kind of can't miss it. <laughs> okay. Kinda. Kind of big. It's 200 square feet. 200 so. square feet of interactive surface. So yes, enjoy. Well, I think we'll take uh, an online question first. And if any of you here in the room want to ask a question about this project, feel free to step up to the microphone. But we'll go to the online question first, I believe. So are all of the museum's artifacts in the interactive walls database? <laughs> Um, it's a really good question. So we uh, display on the wall only the things that are actually in the museum and on display. Obviously there's many, many more artifacts that we have in our collection that are not on display. Um, and so we didn't want to mislead anyone with giving uh, objects that they can't see here. So we've limited the wall just to things that are on display. But if you go on the website, you can search through all of the records that we've made available online. And right now it's about half of the full collection can be perused online. We have one more online question. Was there an artifact that you wanted to include in Milestones but couldn't? Margaret. Hmm. Well, this really is a museum of milestones. Um, and I'm stealing that line from my colleague, Bob. Um, and uh, I think it is then an introduction. So obviously, the Wright Flyer. Um, started in this, the museum was built with the idea that, you know, everything literally and figuratively radiate out from that American invention from 1903. Um, so that's an obvious one. Um, not having Columbia, the command module there, uh, it'd be lovely to have a shuttle. Um, sure. <laughs> to, but to, there's no way we're going to get discovery into that room. Um, so it's really a sampling of uh, what we could put in that space that begins to introduce people to some of these big themes and these big questions, and then hopefully uh, entices people to go farther out and to ask new questions. Well, thank you so much for that. I want to thank all of my colleagues from the museum for joining me today. Thank you to our sponsor, Boeing. And thanks to the audience online and here for your questions. And as we close, I want to just give you some scenes to look at from the opening, reopening of the Bi Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall back on July 1st for the museum's 40th anniversary. 54,000 people joined us that night for the opening, and I want to thank all of you. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>